this area. That was over 12 hours ago. When you locate Captain Keys, radio in, and I'll come pick you up. Okay, hello everyone, and welcome back to Let's Play Halo Anniversary Edition. So we've arrived here in the mission 343 Guilty Spark in the swamp. And boy, let me tell ya, I am in agreement with many other LPers that this, the Anniversary Edition, did not do this level any favors. In fact, it kind of ruined it, actually. So that's uh, drop si drop ship Victor 933's distress signal. Seems that we got some problems here. Yeah, basically the anniversary edition. What they did here is they made the the environment way too bright, and it completely ruins the ambience, the the kind of spookiness of the swamp, so to speak. Like, why is there so much light in this area? Like in the original, right, it's it's dim, it's foggy, it's rainy, and you can't see a whole lot. So yeah, I mean, it's very much like the, those old school, you know, video games or computer games where you have that very distinct kind of um, fog which hides the need to load in textures in the distance, right? It's like a limiter. So yeah, that's kind of what the original was like, but this one it's like, oh, let's just show everything while we're at it. Put all these lights in and make the plants kind of glowing and stuff, and ugh. It's not spooky anymore. Oh, but we have something up there. Well, we're going to cross this log twice. This is the first time. Because right up here is the skull for this mission. Instead of kind of going to the right there. All you need to do is just jump up here. This is a real easy skull to get once we kill some of these Covenant here. Proceed along this ridge line and basically where this uh, shade turret is Yeah, in fact, I don't even think you need to go that way from the log. You can just proceed up here, you know, kill those Covenant and proceed up here. Now drop down, and the skull's right there. So we have the Recession Skull, and when activated, that will consume twice the ammo for every shot. Alright, well we can't really get up this way, so we're going to have to go all the way back around to the crashed dropship there. Yeah, indeed, instead of looking spooky, the environment looks a bit more alien, I should say, you know, especially with these kind of trees that are glowing right here. Yeah, like, what's that all about? What's that supposed to be? And it doesn't really look so much like we're creeping through a swamp as we're creeping through a really rainy evergreen forest, so to speak. It looks like I'm walking around in, in the woods of the Pacific Northwest or something. Yeah, I think basically they increased the draw distance so you can see more stuff in the distance. They increased the lighting and it just, oh. It's no longer spooky. It's just like, all right, where are we going? Okay, let's enter the facility. The elevator is going to come up.
And again, it's the same thing in here. It's like, why do they make these facilities so well lit? Now, since we are playing on easy, we could have picked up the shotgun there from that uh, dropship, Victor 933. But I chose not to because that's not normally how I play the game. And for a really excellent analysis of this mission, check out Ben Plays Games. He's a big Halo fan, and so he, he's done like an analysis of just about every mission and every Halo game and all that. He does a really good analysis of why, you know, this is like the spookiest level, at least when you're playing on the original version of the game, not the Anniversary Edition. Why it works and why it, it's kind of like a whiplash in terms of the tone of the game. Yeah, it looks like instead of like this green goop dripping down, why does it spatter like red blood when it hits the floor? That doesn't make sense. And again, right here, you know, in the original, that blood, there's a lot more blood on the on the walls of that hallway. But now they're just like, eh, well, let's, let's tone it down a bit or something. Ugh. You know. Sorry, I'm just <laughs> kind of endlessly bitching and complaining. Right here is the only place in the game where you see actual like capsules of blamite for the needler. That's actual needler ammo, those pink lozenges. And right here, I think this thing is like a communications transmitter. It's an antenna, essentially. So there are variations of those containers. Not all of them contain weapons. I guess one problem I do have with the uniforms of the Marines, particularly in this game, because they're essentially variations of the uh, army uniforms, is that they look a little bit too clean, so to speak. Yeah, so he's got some kind of like padding, maybe body armor, lightweight body armor, and knee pads and all that on them, but they, they just look way too clean. Like in the original, their, their fatigues and stuff look kind of grimy or dirty or something. Like, they've been well-worn, you know what I mean? I mean, unless these all these Marines have access to washing machines. <laughs> and again, when we come to these rooms where there's like that green glowing chamber in the center, it looks a little bit too fluorescent, you might say. So that's kind of strange, I find. You know, in the original, it's kind of this eerie, sickly green color. There was a slight difference in the uh, the cutscene animation, right? There's a close-up shot of the side of Master Chief where he kind of like wraps his fingers on the the fore end of the weapon.
Private Jenkins Wallace. Now there is a change in the anniversary edition to how this uh, video recording plays, particularly when he fasts forward through it. Yeah, they clean it up a bit too much. Like in the original, you know, it looks kind of grainy and it's, the definition isn't terribly great. Here it's obviously meant to be a digital recording, whereas in the original, it's like it was recorded on old like tape or something, like hi-fi or something, as opposed to digital. And again, the fast forward animation of the, the sound effects for the fast forwarding is a bit, is more digital, like he's scrubbing through it as opposed to like in the original Combat Evolved when he fast forward, it sounds like a tape is being wound forward. Sir. Okay, let's move. Which is weird, right? I mean, look at it. Something trampled the insides. What's that? Plasma scoring? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe there was an accident, you know, a friendly fire or something. What do we have, Sergeant? Looks like a Covenant patrol. Badass elite units. Yep, and Captain yeah. Keys somehow managed to keep his uniform nice and clean, along with the rest of them. Right, well, let's get this door open. I'll try, sir, but it looks like these Covenant worked pretty hard to lock it down. Just well, I'd open the door, Captain, but you see it's locked. Expected halt, wounded, incapacitated, KIA. Yeah, I'd say he's dead. Well, we have ourselves a new unknown enemy. And this is exactly where they were. Now I can actually see down into those things now. All right, well, again, as usual, if you've been living under a rock and you don't know what this is, this is the Flood. Halo's secret horrific zombie enemy. That scared the heck out of just about everyone the first time they encountered it.
Alright, hear more come. Alright, well, now's the time we'll start talking about some of the equipment we're carrying, talk about more of the weapons. Now, I'll start off by talking about the human grenade, although right now I'm just using plasma grenades, but the uh, human grenade is an M9 high explosive dual purpose fragmentation grenade. And, well, much like modern grenades, these work by violently exploding, which fragments the metal casing in all directions upon detonation. The concussive force and shrapnel are said to be lethal up to 16 feet away, and they can injure a person at up to 49 feet away. Unlike the Covenant Plasma Grenade, which we'll talk about in the next mission, human grenades can ricochet off walls, and they have a much shorter delay before detonating. So I'll start talking about some of the Flood enemies, or at least one of them, in this particular mission. The little crawling pods, Flood pods, that come at you in the hundreds are known as infection forms, or pod infectors. The rapid spread of the Flood is actually dependent on the availability of viable hosts, hence the infection form is actually the most common you'll encounter. There are actually a wide variety of infection forms, some like these crawl, Others can fly, swim, or even dig. However, all infection forms exist to subdue or subvert organic targets into hosts for the flood itself. These infection forms have frond-like tentacles that stick out in front of their pod-shaped bodies, which act like the creature's sensory system. The pods themselves are actually filled with noxious gases, and they disperse them, which allows them to jump and bound over obstacles and around things with great speed. Once the infection forms actually latch onto a target, their barbed appendages, that is their tentacles, dig into the body of whatever host it's latched onto. Their tentacles can actually even penetrate armor and environmental suits. Once that happens, they will inject flood cells into the host, which take over the nervous system. The infection form further burrows down into the host, often down into the spine of like a humanoid life form, such as a human or an elite. And the victim quickly mutates into either a combat or a carrier form. That being said, these are not the only kinds of infection forms. The simplest infection forms are actually spores. Now, much like an airborne mold or a fungus, these spores are composed of flood supercells, or FSCs. They're surrounded by a chitinous layer to protect them and allow them to adhere to a host. The spores can actually remain dormant for centuries, and they adapt easily to the environment, waiting until a potential food source disturbs them, whereupon they can enter and infect the host, thereby transforming the existing biomass into flood supercell surrogates, using the host as an incubator for further production of flood cells. I'm just looking at whatever this machine is. <laughs> we don't see any real flood spores in this particular mission, and we won't really see them in, you know, en masse until the next uh, game, Halo 2. That's because the flood in this game are still in the very, very early form known as the feral form, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Anyway, the production of infection forms begins with the establishment of a flood hive. If enough biomass is infected, it can begin transforming the surrounding environment. Non-sapient animals or corpses that are actually too badly damaged or mangled to create combat forms are instead transformed into blisters. These blisters are sacs for producing more infection forms, usually spores themselves. They are pale yellow colored pustules which are prevalent in a landscape that has been completely overrun and overtaken by the flood. In fact, it can reach a point where the entire planet's biosphere is mutated into this sickly wasteland of flood spores, blisters, and infection forms. Oh, we got some marines down there. 
You're about to die. And in case you're wondering why there have been, we saw no elites in our initial uh, incursion into this facility, it's because they've all been turned into these flood combat forms. These bipedal walking forms that we are fighting. There's the door. We shall go through there. It's the only one we can. Let me talk about the weapon we're using right now. Shotguns have been around for centuries and in many ways have actually defined the UNSC Marine Corps and its image of a spaceborne force in readiness. The actual shotgun we are using is the M90 Close Assault Weapon System, or CAUSE, which is used by the Marines. However, for some reason or another, the Anniversary Edition here actually switched the weapon model to the M45E tactical shotgun, which is actually used by the UNSC Army. The difference in game is actually purely cosmetic and it functions the exact same as the M90 shotgun in the original Halo Combat Evolved. So for the sake of just, you know, discussing it, I'm gonna talk about the M90, even though the model we're looking at is the M45E. So the M90 shotgun is manufactured by Weapon System Technology. It has been in service with the Marines for decades. It's a simple pump action shotgun that features an extended 12 shell capacity top loading magazine for boarding actions. It fires the M296 8 gauge magnum shot. Overall, it's actually the most effective weapon against flood forms, particularly at close range given its devastating stopping power. For example, like rifle rounds tend to pass through most of the flood, although you can stop them with the uh, M5 assault rifle. Sniper rifle rounds completely just go right through the flood forms. They really don't do any appreciable damage because they're traveling at such high speeds and with such high velocity. And of course the pistol is very useful against the flood. Uh, I'm just reminded, you know, the original mission in this in Combat Evolved, how it's kind of dimly lit and I mean, it's not like pitch black or anything in here, but it's it's the difference is so noticeable in the lighting. Right? The walls are very kind of barren. The the lighting is much dimmer. It's got kind of a creepy empty ambience to it. Whereas in this in the anniversary edition, it just feels it's too bright. The again, the design, the redesign of the forerunner structures is is too busy, and it just it loses ambience. It loses that creepiness to it. Oh, there's one right there. If we jump up right here, we see some uh, jackals. As well as some humans, in implying that both of them kind of put aside their differences and took their last stand together right here at this point. <laughs> Trying to hold off the flood. Alas, they did not make it.
There we go. That took care of him. All right, now we come here to the third elevator and we are about to reach the last terminal, or at least the terminal for this mission. What you need to do is once we activate the elevator, we need to jump off of it in the opposite direction because it's right there. Don't worry, you can recall the elevator when you finish the cutscene. Construction of a sarcophagus around the unexplained vessel was completed today. No occupants ever exited. No attempts to communicate were made, other than the automated broadcast that repeated every 72.83 seconds until the signal terminated one week ago. In accordance with procedure, no attempts at physical or remote contact were made with any survivors of this vessel's inelegant landing. Atmosphere from inside the craft stuck 52 weeks before the signal ceased. No relationship between these two events can be established with certainty. Gases that did escape were sterilized. No further sign of alien visitors or rescuers has been identified on any sensor systems. I have now endured 60,000 years without word from outside the array. I have no way to know whether we actually saved the galaxy we destroyed. And because of the protocol, I sat silently while my first chance to be judged for those acts died. To say that I regret being forced to this outcome is a tremendous understatement. But as I perform my inspection of the quarantine labs today, I am reminded of the gravity of my responsibilities. Just one of these spores, if released from this facility, would render the ultimate judgment against our self-appointed role as protectors of this galaxy. When the plan to maintain the Halo Array was created, it was a point of some contention whether we should preserve any remnant of the flood infection. Many thought this unwise, as there was a notable chance that one day one of our containment facilities might be breached. Those who held this belief were almost successful at convincing the Ecumen Council to destroy the last blood samples. But oddly enough, it was the librarian who decided otherwise. And I believe she was correct. I know in a way, I cannot logically explain that there exists a way to actually defeat the world. To immunize? To cure? I still struggle with multiple layers of memory of fighting for blood. But I know this cure is possible, even though the poor genius of the Forerunners was unable to achieve it. The Forerunners' ancient enemy held and used that knowledge once, but it was denied to us. And without samples for further study, that cure will never again be found. Of course, I have no reason to believe that here lies the entirety of the parasite. It may be waiting in the frozen void beyond this galaxy, or worse, inexorably drifting toward us. I don't know what survives out beyond my installation, but I know that in order for anything to survive, I have to protect this installation and its quarantine very carefully. Yes, the library was right to store it, examine it, continue to seek a cure. Still, Next visitor, things will be different. Okay, well, that was this mission's terminal, and there's a lot to unpack here. For now, let's actually discuss the secondary nature of the Halo Ring world itself. The ring itself is actually a structure that is 10,000 kilometers in diameter. The band itself is 318 kilometers wide and 48 kilometers deep. The exterior is made out of exotic metal alloys and housed the conduits for its immense power systems. The honeycomb structure is a dense latticework of girders, columns, and cantilevers with numerous access tunnels for the ring's drones and maintenance 
equipment. This is Echo 419. Chief, is that you? I lost your signal when you disappeared inside the structure. What's going on down there? I'm tracking movement all over the place. Sir, thank God you're here. We've been lost out here for hours. After we lost contact with the rest of the mission, we, we headed to the RV point, and then these, these, these things, they, they ambushed us. We've got to get out of here. Time There's a that. large tower a few hundred meters from your current position. Find a way above the fog and foliage canopy and I can move in and pick you up. It's normally deployed in an orbit around a stable gravity well such as the gas giant we're orbiting known as Threshold. This also means that in the event of a compromise, the ring can be deorbited and crashed into the planet. While the primary function of Halo is to be used as a weapon against the, an outbreak of the Flood, its secondary functions, as Guilty Spark noted, are as biological refuges, communications arrays, and research facilities to study a possible cure to the Flood infection. And it's strongly implied that the purpose of the facility we just fought our way out of was probably a Flood research laboratory. The original Halo array was actually a series of 12 rings known as the Senescent Array. These rings were larger than the current one we're on and were found to be too cumbersome to transport, they were too destructive, and too narrow in their effect to be an effective weapon against the Flood. They were originally tested on the ancestor human world of Charm Hakur, and unfortunately used against the Forerunners themselves, with most of the Forerunner species being killed. A series of battles actually resulted in all but two of the original Halo Array being destroyed, although one of the surviving rings, the Omega Ring, was later destroyed as well, leaving only the Zeta Ring left from the original 12. Subsequently, another six rings were constructed of the current design, of which we are on one of them right now. But indeed, the Flood is basically an extraordinarily virulent disease that spreads and mutates whatever it comes into contact with. There have been numerous ways to propose to um, prevent the flood from spreading and even cure it as a disease, but we have nobody has been able to successfully find a cure for it. Anyway, we'll discuss more about the flood and what it does in the next mission. Alright, the sentinels have arrived, shooting their freaking laser beams. Never realize how big this actual structure is that we're fighting around right now. Again, you can pretty much see everything now in this mission, in this environment. Come, this way. 